I really do want to welcome you all today to our first event of our fall lecture series sponsored by the Malta Study Center and the Friends of the Malta Study Center. Uh, before I begin today, I really do want to just take a quick moment and thank the Himmel staff for helping arrange Dr. Good's visit, particularly Julie Diebent, for helping make so many wonderful arrangements for us. And also to extend my gratitude to Alcoon Library for allowing us to hope, um, have our lecture here at AB2, which I believe was recently remodeled for such wonderful purposes. Um, if you are unable to uh, join us for the reception today, um, and we're just came, walked into our uh, lecture now, uh, I do invite you to visit our new facility, which is can be walked straight from here over to the new Himmel Library. I think you will enjoy it very much. And it is with uh, great pleasure that I introduce today my colleague, Dr. Jonathan Good of Reinhardt University. Um, I realized um, in a conversation that I had with him earlier today that Dr. Good and I have actually been crossing paths unknowingly for over two decades uh, before we met in Georgia three years ago. Um, both of us, believe it or not, were students in different departments at the University of Toronto in the 1990s without knowing it. And even here at St. John's University in 1996, we sat in the same lecture hall with Umberto Eco when he traveled up from the University of Minnesota, and I was at the School of Theology. Um, in addition to that, um, Doctor, when I moved to Georgia in 2009 to start my teaching career at Columbus State University, Dr. Good helped facilitate the creation and the promotion of CSU's Medieval and Renaissance Studies program through his sponsorship of the Samurai Annual Conference of the Georgia Medieval Group at the campus. Um, and I can uh, let him know today that the, uh, the, dean of the, library, uh, the dean of the college down there is so thrilled about our promotion of medieval Renaissance studies um, that he has uh, directed new funds to turn the certificate into a full minor with the hopes of turning it into a major. And they have 20 students studying uh, medieval Renaissance studies down there, which is really quite remarkable. So my personal gratitude to Dr. Good today. But it is with really no surprise that Dr. Good has become a leader in medieval studies in the southeastern United States and nationally, given his academic research and commitment to promoting medieval studies. He completed his AB degree from Dartmouth College in 1994 and his Master's of Arts in History at the University of Toronto in 1995 under the direction of Himmel's friend, Dr. Michael Jervers. Uh, Dr. Good journeyed at that time to our fair Minnesota and completed his dissertation in the History Department at the University of Minnesota with the title of St. George for England, Sanctity and National Identity, 1272-1509 under the direction of Dr. Barbara Hanewalt. Since graduating, Dr. Good has served as a professor of history at Reinhardt University in Alaska, Georgia. He is widely published scholar in many national and international journals, including topics on history of heraldry, Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, the cult of St. George in England, and with, with recent work on the early history of Canada. His dissertation research was published in 2009 with the title, The Cult of St. George in Medieval England. Dr. Good has received several academic awards and fellowships, including recognitions of teaching, scholarship, and faculty service. And in 2009, he was named a fellow of the Royal Heraldry Society of Canada, which I am very much looking forward to a dinner conversation about my prospective dreaming coats of arms. <laughs> Today, he will be speaking on St. George within, internet, within an international context in a, title, in a talk entitled St. George and Al-Qadir, A Case of Middle Eastern Convergence. Let us welcome Dr. Jonathan Good. Thank you very much, Daniel, for the introduction, and thank you for the invitation to speak today. It is an honor. And it is always a pleasure to be back in the great state of Minnesota. Um, so yes, uh, the basis of this paper is the idea that al Hudr is the Muslim version of St. George. A very frequent statement in writings about St. George as he is venerated in the Middle East. Um, there's an interesting travel writer by the name of William Dalrymple 
uh, who wrote a book called From the Holy Mountain in 1994. Uh, he provides a good example of this. He uh, followed the path of a 6th century Byzantine monk named John Moskos, who started in Mount Athos in Greece, went through Asia Minor, through the Levant, and ended up in Egypt. And so that's always a good setup for a travel book. You follow the itinerary of uh, someone in the past, and then you see what, what, uh, what you find. And uh, Dalrymple, sometimes he finds just ruins, other times flourishing Christian communities. This is, of course, before the rise of Islam. But in 94, yes, 94, Dalrymple found ruins, sometimes flourishing Christian communities. Dalrymple's visit to the shrine of the Beit Jala outside Jerusalem is eye-opening. There, in the same Orthodox Church of St. George, Christians venerate St. George and Muslims al Khudr. And Dalrymple attests to a certain fusion of these two figures, with both Christians and Muslims referring to him as Khudr, and a Muslim happy to have received a cure from the oil from the lamp burning in front of an icon of St. George. Other sources attest to a similar uniting in other places. On the surface, this is surprising given how much Christians and Muslims are supposed to dislike each other. So, what is really going on here? In order to answer this question, we need to discuss who these two figures are. So, for St. George, I mean, if he ever existed, and there's no evidence that he did, uh, George would have been a young Christian soldier martyred somewhere in the Eastern Roman Empire during the great persecution of Diocletian in the early 4th century. With his relics ostensibly entombed in Lydda, modern-day Lot, near Tel Aviv. This was St. George's major shrine by the 6th century. Many such martyrs were created under Diocletian, of course, but of them all, St. George became one of the most popular. I'm still trying to figure out why. Church dedications, inscriptions, and other references to him became very common throughout the late antique East, and many versions of his passion can be found in different languages. As with all popular saints, George was venerated as a powerful intercessor against various types of harm. But as the Byzantine Empire fought against the Persians and then against the Muslims, and especially after the militarization of the empire under Heraclius, George's original profession became significant. So saints like George, Theodore, Demetrius, or Mercurius, who had been soldiers in real life, then come to be patrons of a Christian army and would appear in the sky during battles urging on the faithful and uh, inspiring them to do great deeds on behalf of Christ. Western crusaders were certainly inspired by this custom and experienced the same thing at Antioch in 1098 when a group of warrior saints appeared, including St. George at the head of them. And according to Raymond of Achille, George appeared and helped the Crusaders to take Jerusalem in 1099. So from that point on, what had been a Byzantine custom becomes a Western custom. He becomes the preeminent saint of crusading, and then very shortly thereafter of knighthood, whether that is exercised on crusade or not. Um, and it is largely due to this connection with knighthood that uh, St. George's legend acquired the romantic story about how the saint rescued a princess from a dragon by riding it down and spearing it with his lance and then decapitating it upon the conversion of her town. This story was given wide publicity in the 13th century golden legend of Jacobus de Beragine and became a very popular artistic subject. You rarely see St. George without, without the dragon. He continued, of course, to be a powerful intercessor against evil, as attested by his status as one of the 14 holy helpers. How the English came to view him as their particular patron is an interesting story and largely the result of the reign of King Edward I, 1272 to 1307. Edward had gone on crusade 
and acquired an affinity for St. George while he was there. The king subsequently used St. George for propaganda purposes in his wars against the Welsh and the Scots and placed his entire army, not just his knights, under the saint's protection. Edward III, following his stunningly successful Crecy campaign at the beginning of what became the Hundred Years' War, founded the Order of the Garter under the patronage of St. George in 1348, which gave the saint a permanent institutional place at the English court. It is my theory that Edward III's successor, Richard II, who was absolutist at heart and deposed in 1399 for that reason, helped make St. George become a national saint by personally favoring St. Edward the Confessor. St. George, at that point, became associated with the good government of Edward III's reign, and Edward the Confessor became the patron saint of bad government. Henry V's well-known victory at Agincourt in 1415 was procured with St. George's aid. Later, the legend arose that the saint had been seen in the sky during the battle as he had appeared to the Crusaders at Antioch. All claimants to the throne during the so-called Wars of the Roses in the late 15th century publicly venerated St. George as a means of proving they were worthy for the job. And this. Uh, survives the Reformation, then to this day, St. George is the patron saint of England. al Khudr, on the other hand, is perhaps uh, less familiar to a Western audience. His name means the Green One, and he is a revered Muslim saint or Wali. Like George, he may have pagan origins, although I am generally leery of these sorts of theories without explicit evidence. He's quite popular in the Muslim world, through which he travels in order to help people before promptly disappearing. One of his abilities is to travel great distances in a very short time. And one tradition has it that he prays every Friday in five mosques, Mecca, Medina, Jerusalem, Cuba, and Sinai. Along with Enoch, Elijah, and Jesus, he is one of the four prophets recognized as being alive or immortal. In Hudr's case, immortality was acquired through drinking the water of life, parallel to Utnapishtim in the Epic of Gilgamesh. His name has given rise to the notion that he is colored green, and lately an attempt has been made to posit him as the source, via Spain, of the Green Knight in the poem Sir Gawain in the Green Knight. I don't know if this theory uh, will hold out. It requires further uh, investigation, I think. Uh, certainly, Hudr does not always appear green, since he can take on numerous disguises in the course of his mission. Although not mentioned by name, he is usually identified as the righteous servant of God in Surah 18 of the Quran and is charged with instructing Moses. Moses promises to learn humbly and not to question Hudr, but Hudr acts most inexplicably, and Moses cannot help himself. First, Khudr bores a hole in the bottom of a boat belonging to some fishermen, thereby ruining their livelihood. Then he kills a young boy. And finally, he fixes a wall in a town right after its inhabitants had refused to offer hospitality to him and Moses. With each of these incidents, Moses breaks his promise and expresses disappointed surprise. But Khudr then reveals his reasons. He destroyed the boat because it was about to be seized by a king. The boy was evil, and Hudr killed him so that Allah might give his believing parents a better son. And he repaired the wall, because beneath it was buried some treasure belonging to two orphans, whose deceased father had been righteous and who would be in no position to defend it should its presence be revealed. The message here is that God's wisdom is beyond human understanding that Khudr gets to reveal it to Moses, himself a revered figure, shows how powerful Khudr is. Other texts in which Khudr appears are the Islamic Alexander romances, where he and Alexander the Great find the waters of immortality together, but only Khudr gets to drink them, and in which Khudr helps Alexander construct a barrier 
against the giants Gog and Magog. He appears in two Hadith and in several tales of the Arabian Nights in which he shows up to help people. In the 10th century Persian history of prophets and kings by Muhammad al-Tabari, uh, it provides more details about Khudr, including that he was a, tempor a contemporary of Abraham the Patriarch and that he was Persian, although this is certainly local pride on display. This identification is not necessarily recognized by other Muslims. He was of particular importance to Ibn Arabi, the 13th century Arab Andalusian Sufi mystic, whose autobiography detailed his own three encounters with Khudr, one at Seville, when Hudr met Ibn Arabi on the road and taught him to submit to spiritual masters and not contradict them. One in the Bay of Tunis, when Hudr appeared walking on water and conversed in a language that is special to him. And one near the south coast of Cadiz, when Hudr stretched a prayer rug seven cubits in the air for the benefit of one of Ibn Arabi's companions who did not believe in miracles. Indeed, within the Sufi tradition, Encounters with Khudr bestow wisdom and can serve as a shortcut to esoteric knowledge. Normally, such knowledge is conferred by a master through lines of transmission dating back to Muhammad. But just as Gabriel revealed the Quran directly to Muhammad, so also can Khudr reveal wisdom directly to the Sufi. All right, so why would George and Khudr have anything to do with each other. Ostensibly, they do not have much in common. Khudr does not generally help armies in fighting, and George has many qualities, but a connection to wisdom is not one of them. The easy theory is that they both have a common origin in a pagan past, that they are different manifestations of some archetype. This theory is in accord with a great deal of scholarship on the cult of St. George. No genuine primary saint, excuse me, no genuine primary source for this saint exists. Indeed, his earliest legends are models of hyperbole, featuring seven years of inventive and prolonged torture, which did not prevent George from performing numerous miracles of tree growing, conversion, and self-resurrection. It is on this account that the allegedly papal Gelasian decree of the late 5th century recommended that the Passion of St. George and others like it not be read in church, designating the authors as heretics, idiots, and unbelievers. So the combination of the widespread popularity of the saint, the lack of a real primary source about him, and the supposedly official condemnation of the Passion have led scholars to believe that St. George must have had pagan origins. To the great Cambridge anthropologist Sir James Fraser, he was a version of the Babylonian god Tammuz, who was a deification of the annual cycle of vegetation, and who would thus die and be reborn every year. According to Fraser, this explains George's repeated resurrections and his causing of dead wood to bring forth fruit in some versions of his legend and certain cult practices in Eastern Europe, connecting St. George to agriculture. To Francois Cumont, George had his origins in Mithraism, the Roman mystery religion. This identification is on account of the three thunderous resurrections of St. George, or St. George's stamping of his foot to produce a spring of water with which to baptize converts, both of which have their parallels in Mithraic mythology that a certain monastery of St. George in the Caucasus sacrificed a bull on St. George's feast day, as did Mithras, and shared the flesh with the local peasants, also points to a Mithraic connection, according to Cumont. To Charles Clermont Ganneau, however, St. George was a Christianized Horus, the Egyptian god who battled Set as St. George battled the dragon. Unfortunately for Clermont Ganneau, this theory is based on an error because St. George's dragon story only became part of his legend in the 11th century. Then there is the long-standing attempt to posit heretical or or origins for St. George. Um, perhaps you're familiar with the George of Cappadocia, uh, who had become the Arian Archbishop of Alexandria under Julian the Apostate in 363. He was lynched 
on account of being corrupt and widely hated. His Arian followers, however, venerated him as a saint, and when they converted to Catholicism, they brought his veneration into the church, and the entire subsequent cult of St. George may be attributed to this illicit importation. This is the theory endorsed by Edward Gibbon in his famous 18th century Enlightenment work, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. So, obviously these theories cannot all be right, and it is likely that they are all wrong. This sort of analysis is somewhat passe, for the main reason that splitting is better than lumping. One cannot focus one's attention on superficial similarities between phenomena without considering the manifold differences between them as well. Similarly, while Christianity may have absorbed some of the characteristics of the world it grew up in, it seems that far more allegedly pagan customs arose over time within Christianity itself. If Christianity appears to have taken on characteristics of other religions, it is usually because Christianity as a religion must provide for certain strong and near uni universal human desires, such as the desire for children, or crop growth, or safe travel. It is only natural that once Christians accepted that saints wielded intercessory power, they should begin to pray to them for these and other things. This does not mean that Christian saints are simply new versions of pagan gods. Any continuity between paganism and Christianity is likely to be found in human nature not in religion as such. Thus, it is likely that what we have with St. George and Hutter is not that one came from the other, or that they both come from a common pagan source, but rather that they converged after the conquest of the Levant by the Arabs and of Asia Minor by the Turks. Although anything might happen on the ground, Muslims are under the injunction that there should be no compulsion in religion. Christian communities under Islamic rule may have suffered various disabilities, but Christians were generally not expelled, slaughtered, or forcibly converted. F.W. Hasluck opined that points of contact may be regarded either as inheritances from Christianity or introduced with the deliberate purpose of conciliating Christians to a form of Islam. And there are many points of contact. In Turkey and Syria, Khudr is celebrated on April 23rd, St. George's Day. Hasluk notes that Muslim vows to Khudr are often paid in churches to St. George. Among many examples of shared or transformed space, a St. George church in Beirut was churned into a mosque of Khudr. A church to St. George at Lydda was partly left to the Greeks and partly transformed into a mosque. At Adrianople, a 17th century traveler noted a place of Khudr with an imperial kiosk said to occupy the site of a church of St. George. And a church of St. George in Cairo, where mad people are cured with certainty if detained for three days, often sees Turks saying their Friday prayers in it. Hasluk notes that Khudr has acquired a horse, not part of his original iconography and perhaps inherited from St. George. Uh, Hasluck also claims that Khudr has slain a dragon, which would be a definite inheritance. Going in the other direction, in uh, the east, both George and Khudr are invoked to protect travelers. Such protection is generally not one of George's specialties, that's more like St. Christopher's. Uh, and it's something that he may have acquired from his association with Khudr. Sarah Wolper calls this process hybridization and writes that it allows us to understand that there was a dynamic and productive Christian population, at least in Anatolia, during the late 13th and early 14th centuries, with each tradition benefiting from a state of cultural and literary production freely borrowed from the other. Although one could say that dedicating a Christian shrine to a Muslim saint, particularly in the hopes of winning converts to Islam, is a form of imperialism, it's probably better than the wholesale destruction of Christian buildings and the expulsion of any survivors, although of course this occasionally did happen. And it is certainly interesting to note the staying power of St. George, how Muslims begin to worship him as Khudr, 
that is, sometimes attempts at winning Christians to the Islamic faith simply had the effect of introducing Christianity into Islam. This idea of convergence as a means of conciliating Christians with Islam is strengthened when we consider another figure that became associated with Khudr, the figure of Elijah, the Old Testament prophet from the two books of Kings. As mentioned, Elijah is one of the four immortal prophets in Islam, and indeed Islam, as a re-emphasis of the Semitic elements in Christianity, as H.B. Moss once put it, seems to place more emphasis on characters from the Hebrew Bible than Christianity does. However, when Muslims encountered the numerous Jewish sites associated with Elijah throughout the Levant, a similar convergence between Elijah and Hodor took place. One would think that Muslims would have felt free to venerate Elijah at the Jewish sites without changing anything, given that Elijah is one of their prophets too. But apparently he was not as important as al Khudr, who was more powerful. Furthermore, as an exclusively Muslim figure, Khudr could serve the useful purpose of Islamicizing Jewish sites to Elijah as he transformed churches to St. George. But what we find is the same thing, convergence between Elijah and Hutter, who are often depicted as a pair in manuscripts when they are not being venerated as a composite figure of Hutter Ilyas in, or in Turkey, Hidrels. To return to Christianity and Islam, we still do not know the answer to the question, why do we find convergence between the specific figures of St. George and al Hutter? One must note that the identification is not universal. Among Armenians and Kurds, we see a convergence between Khudr and St. Sergius. In Hagia Sophia, the curative powers of the sweating column are attributed by Muslims to Khudr, but by Christians to St. Gregory. And the Zawiya of Elwan Salibi, dedicated to Khudr, was built over a church of St. Theodore, not St. George. But it seems that for our two saints, their widespread popularity and enormous intercessory power were probably enough. Both of the saints provided help, which is always a good thing. Lance Laird has recently written about the shrine at Beit Jala, where some Muslims have gone so far as to have their children baptized in the name of Khudr, as an example of a specifically Palestinian site as a means for Christians and Jews to come together in the face of Israeli occupations. That, that's an example of, that's pushing people together. Um, if there is any formal similarity between the two cults, it is likely to do with agricultural regeneration. Khudr being green was naturally one to look after the crops. George's name, of course, means earth worker or farmer, and his feast day of April 23rd is a day when crops are starting to grow. Needless to say, guaranteeing the food supply is exceptionally important for any agricultural society. But this shared trait is simply implicit and perhaps even coincidental. Insofar as St. George did represent military aid to Christians against non-Christians, perhaps he was a fitting target for Islamification. Wolper notes that it was following the reconquest of the Crusader states that, by Muslims that Khudr sites really got going. But as mentioned, the transformation was never entirely complete and sometimes went in the opposite direction. The convergence that we see between George and Khudr is generally unknown in the West. It may well stand in for a whole panoply of other points of contact, not only in Palestine and Anatolia, but also Sicily, Spain, and the Balkans, accommodation and adaptation and mutual understanding between neighbors at the local level. Professor Gulo brought to my attention the fact that all three of Christians, Muslims, and Jews participated in the Corpus Christi processions in medieval Spain. But what we're most familiar with today, of course, is conflict, historically jihad and crusading, and more recently, things like the Muslim Brotherhood and persecuting the Coptic Church in Egypt, massacres in Darfur or northern Nigeria, attacks by Al-Qaeda against Crusaders, or the rise of the Islamic State and its persecution of what it calls Nazarenes. 
Dr. Gulo also pointed out to me ISIS's deplorable destruction of the shrine of the Prophet George in Mosul on July 27th of this year. I wish they'd simply rededicated it to Khur, like in the old days. It is most interesting to note, indeed, how St. George is at once the patron saint of crusading and a figure that bridges the divide between Christian and Muslim. Echoes of this dynamic are seen in the medieval West when we see knights venerating St. George as an exemplar of their profession and commoners venerating him as a powerful patron and intercessor against evil. Like many symbols, St. George has multiple meanings, some of which can be contradictory. But that doesn't mean we can't choose the ones we want to agree with. The affinity that both Christians and Muslims have for St. George may have political implications in England today. St. George has, in that country, enjoyed a modest revival of late with the devolution of the United Kingdom, that is, the advent of national assemblies for Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland with substantive political power. England has been forced to shed some of its 18th century British heritage and to recover some of its medieval and specifically English heritage. The renewed celebration of St. George's Day on April 23rd is one manifestation of this, as is the revival of the St. George's Cross flag, a plain red cross on a white background for sporting events. Reporters of the English national teams were far likely to wave the Union Jack, properly the symbol of the entire United Kingdom, prior to the Euro 96 soccer tournament. The trouble is that this symbol clearly descends from a crusading banner, and as such has been interpreted by some members of England's substantial Muslim minority as offensive. So you sometimes you read in the newspaper, you know, police told fan to hide racist St. George flag. Okay? That's one way of looking at it. Uh, another way is this. I was pleased to note that in a recent council meeting in Radstock, Somerset, when certain councillors objected to flying the St. George flag as offensive to Muslims, that a spokeswoman for the Muslim Council of Britain said that the saint needs to take his rightful place as a national symbol of inclusivity rather than a symbol of hatred. And a spokesman for the Council of the Bristol Muslim Cultural Society said, I think they are going a bit far here. To say that Muslims are offended I don't think is correct. We understand the flag is part of this country's heritage. And in fact, many, many Muslims will identify as being British themselves. He certainly could have gone farther to note the conversion, the convergence of George and Khudr uh, in many places in the Near East. And that even if people don't believe in prayer and miracles anymore, historically, George presides over the meeting of two cultures on amicable terms. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for the discussion today, uh, Dr. Good. I'll go ahead and uh, field a few questions for you, if you want to answer. Have any questions for today? I I can go ahead and begin with one. Um, I'll go ahead, Anton. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you very much for for an interesting talk. I just have a, a couple of questions. First, why do you pronounce Khudr? Because uh, in Arabic and Persian origin is Khidr. And I'm quite, I'm quite sure, sorry. Uh, this is the first one. Uh, uh, especially in the Alexander Persian novel, it is always Hazrat uh, uh The second one is that do, did you make such a parallel with Ashab al Kaf, uh, the, uh, eh, eh, the boys from Ephesus? which are, there is a special surah in Quran, they are also Byzantine uh, saints in uh, Anatolia, which were first uh, very popular Byzantine saints, and that uh, they also were uh, 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 worshipped by Muslims, and there is a special surah in Quran, Ashab al Kaf, which uh, is just the story of these uh, uh, saints. And it is also, the Byzantinists tell us that the origin of this cult is also pre-Christian. So it means that I think it was a general uh, general tendency of uh, heathen cults 
uh, uh, should be by uh, in the Byzantine time. And the third uh, one, I think the situation generally is not that simple because uh, in Islamic text there are a lot of prayers and legends on, on, on uh, Georgis, Greek Georgis. So mm -hmm. that means that I think that it would be this uh, kind of divergence. Uh, it, I think it, it was not that simple. Sure, no, and, and it's true. I mean, the Lance Laird article that I quoted, uh, they talk about that there's, there are Muslims who object to this. They, they object to the Muslims going to the Church of St. George, and there are Christians who don't like the Muslims coming there either. But, so this is largely, a, a, I would say, a folk uh, tradition. But the, the, the Ephesus, are these, 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 these the seven sleepers, sleepers of Ephesus? Yes, yeah, oh, okay. so it's Kath, the special surah of Quran. All right, okay, thank you. I'll have a look at that. Partly uh, moving on, thank you for the all for fascinating paper. Partly moving on from this question. Um, so, as far as I can tell, the examples you gave of, of actual conversions are late medieval Ottoman periods, the 14th century and so on. So, originally, um, considering this Al Qadr, which is the, the Arabic for St. George and Al Qadr, the Arabic for, for uh, Al Qadr, um, can we perhaps speak of involuntary confusion turning into uh, convergence? As in, the, the names in Arabic would be the same, the same vowels. Uh, sorry, the same. Uh, Consonant, sorry, uh, mm -hmm. from English. Um, so, is that possible, you think? Because um, obviously there are very different people, the two of them, as you point out yourself, they're not military, or Al Qaeda is not military compared to St. George and so on. Um, and then, secondly, as to the shrines itself, for example, in, in Beit Jala, indeed, it's a shared shrine, but can we speak of a shared saint in this case? Because for example, there's an Austrian Holmes, which is since, I think, early Byzantine times, uh, a monastery for St. George, which was never shared mm -hmm. with Muslims. So maybe it's just a shared shrine, so they use the same place for different reasons. Yes. And I think in, in Bajala specifically, the, what you mentioned about the, the baptism ritual, I think there's a, a study recently that has sort of argued that Muslim, what we see as of baptism, is for them more of a healing ritual mm -hmm. and not really a conversion to Christianity. No, no, of course not. So, so could you say something more about whether it's sharing the space or sharing the same? I think that it is. It is. It, it is. This convergence happens in space. There are there are spaces to Saint George, and then Al Qadr is marked onto that. And so, yes, it is an attempt that the Muslims go to venerate Khudr, the Christians go to venerate St. George. What I, what I find interesting is how these two figures then, they converge in the popular mind. Mm -hmm. That Christians start calling St. George Khudr. And uh, that Muslims will, um, you know, that, they, that, that, that St. George gives to Khudr a, 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 a horse or a dragon. Um, but no, they, it's, never, it's never a complete syncretic process where you get this new new figure, but it is a, it's a, it's a Venn diagram <laughs> where the, the circles are always moving closer. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for, that was very interesting comparison between the two figures. Uh, I just had a question when you were quoting the Surah, chapter 8, I believe. 18. Chapter 18, yeah. Uh, you said when Al-Khidr encountered with Alexander and helped him build uh, the barrier between God and Him and God. Uh -huh. uh, I believe in the Surah it says there are two different people, like uh, the guy who helped him build, helped build the barrier, his name is uh, Lulu Khamenei. Okay. So how would that work? Um, I, okay, so yeah, so Surah 18 is the whole, is the whole um, story between Moses and Khudr. Uh, so, the, so there's that. The Alexander, when he, with Alexander romances, I, I wasn't aware that was in the Quran, but there's a whole separate body of literature that Alexander romances where they go and they find the waters of immortality. Um, 
But the, I don't know about Alexandria, but the, the guy who helped build uh, the barrier between the Gog and Magog and the people was a guy named uh, Lulu Karnay. Mm -hmm. he, he was a traveler. He traveled from west to east, helping different people at a time. And then when he came to the east, I believe, he helped people build a barrier between Gog and Magog. But he wasn't al -Khid. Okay, no, no, no. This would be a separate uh, tradition uh, in the Alexander Roman. Uh, thank you for letting me know that. I'll, I'll have to uh, modify that. Thanks. Uh, this is uh, more of a point of information than anything else. Uh, the story that you told of uh, Al Qudair and Moses um, and Qudair uh, wrecks a fishing boat and um, kills a boy and repairs a wall. Uh, there's a similar sort of story told about one of the early Irish things. Uh -huh. And uh, the incidents are different. Uh, for example, a uh, peasant's cow is killed, uh, but it ends with him repairing a wall. And the reason for repairing the wall, for killing the cow and repairing the wall are very similar. The cow dies in place of the peasant's wife, and the wall, the saint repairs the wall so that the evil owner will not get the money and save the Yes, and so the question is, how, yeah, do we have an archetype here that has managed to come down? Is it coincidental? Do we have a, do we have someone who managed to travel to Ireland? I don't know. These uh, these are fascinating questions. And uh, yeah. well, I, I know what the Irish would say. But yes. you know. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, and there it very quickly becomes a primacy issue. Yeah. I was, uh, if, I, if I may ask one question real quick. Um, one of the points you make is that um, that within the Western tradition, George, of course, kind of becomes this saint based on kind of tied to the Crusades early on, um, and then becomes part of the chivalric aspect, and then England takes on a royal um, connotation. But at the same time, in Europe, George also finds himself moving into the daily life of of early townsfolk, particularly in confraternities and guilds, guilds become venerating George um, in Italy and Spain, um, George becomes important. And these guild traditions seem to be more in common with the kind of the daily practice of George, not as a militarized saint, but kind of more focusing on these other traditions tied closer to the passion, uh, early passion narratives. and. Um, and what you're talking about is that within the Islamic tradition, um, when these two converge on the same space, it tends to be the same type of people going to that space as opposed to a, a, a class of warriors going to that. And is that how I'm understanding? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, this is a, a popular thing. It's popular. Mm -hmm. So the convergence might be within this popular cultural level rather than this kind of aristocratic. Yes. Uh, Well, I would like to thank everybody for coming again, and um, we will be having two more uh, lectures um, this semester. Anton, of course, will be speaking in November or December? I think in December. In December. And Jan, will you be speaking for us? Or not? Nicholas, 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 Nicholas. Nicholas will be okay. And he's in November. Oh, great. Perfect. So uh, those announcements can be found on the bulletin board and also on the uh, Facebook pages and so forth. So thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Good. Thank you.